start. Sure. That's okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks to everybody for being so patient, um, particularly on VC. They've left me to work the VC. So goodness only knows what's going to happen because I'm technophobic. Um, but anyway, I want to introduce uh, Kate Ingram and she is going to talk to us about falls, faints and some of the uh, physiology behind it. Okay, thanks very much. Right, thank you. Thanks, Sue. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone in the uh, teleconference. It's an impressive number of sites that have dialed in. Um, let us know if you can't hear or can't see if I start walking around the room. Um, so what I want to go through today is a bit of a sort of, uh, we've tried to look at the titles and the topics this year and um, work out what hasn't been covered and done a little bit of a potpourri of perhaps some of the medical causes of some falls that haven't been discussed so far. So I might just um, start by introducing, oh, which is a little bit big, I apologise for that, it's good on my screen, I'm not so good on the screen, um, a, a case which is the typical sort of case where we're trying to tease out exactly what's happened in this particular patient. So that's an 84 year old man, presents to ED over, after falling overnight and being found the next morning by the carer who's visiting and he was on the floor in his hallway. So he got some sort of resuscitation and acute care because for the usual complications of a long lie after being on the floor, he received management for hypothermia, dehydration, rhabdomyolysis, which is muscle crush, and renal failure. And after that, you sort of get to take a history of the events of last night. Um, and he tells you he got up to go to the toilet, had been to the toilet, got up, and on the way back, um, when he felt dizzy and collapsed. Not sure if he lost consciousness, and that's a pretty common scenario, that the elderly just can't really tell us whether they lost consciousness. They're not quite sure whether they're dealing with a sick boy episode or not. Um, so, what are the possible explanations for this? Any, any suggestions over what might be happening? Blood pressure related? Yeah, so it could be that he's got postural hypotension, mightn't it? And he's in standing, he's been supine in bed, um, so absolutely. Anything else? Did he open his bowels or? Um, he passed urine. But why? I think you're on the right track. Possibly UTI? Yeah. No, those are babies. Uh, yes, to both of those. Certainly if he's got a UTI, which is making him a bit dehydrated and hypovolemic, mm. hypotensive, mm. yes. Um, but I was more considering whether he's had micturition related syncope, which we'll talk about. So if he's straining to void, you can also precipitate a vago vago vago. What are the other possibilities? Anyone else? I'm not sure how it works for you giving me feedback from the rural area, but you can try. If you're close to a microphone. Are you thinking TIA or? Um, TIAs, I probably will mention, rarely cause people to black out and rarely just cause dizziness. I won't say never, but it'd be pretty rare. Unless he had facial droop, mm -hmm. sudden loss of vision, sudden loss of mm -hmm. um, limb function, um, which would make it more likely. Anyone? Kate, okay, sorry, it's brewing. Can I just interrupt? It's quite hard to actually hear. There's a lot of feedback. I don't know if it's from your end or whether there's other sites that aren't muted. And also, we can't see this screen at all, so I'm not... Oh. Like it's, you can't read what's on there. Ah, okay. We'll try to problem solve that with our limited <laughs> IT knowledge. I think Sue's onto the job here. Um, I will repeat the um, any comments from the audience because I'm suddenly realising you won't be able to hear them. Can you can you not see anything at all? We can see you, but we can't see the screen. So whatever was typed up on the screen, the camera angle is you know, to the such obliquely looking at the screen. So we're going to link the um, pr the presentation to the camera, or is it just... It should be showing... Is it a data projector? It should be, no, it should be on your screen. That was how um, I asked them to set it up. So uh, let me no, just... So we can see Kate talking, but we can't see, can't see the, the, screen. the actual writing or the, the actual presentation. You know how you normally can switch camera views to have um, the actual presentation on our screen? We can't see that. Is Broome the only site with that problem? Or the other sites itself. got that issue too? It moves itself. You can see him in Selby as well. Yeah. Uh, so okay, I'll, I'll ring them. I do apologise. It wasn't what we wanted. 
All right, perhaps while Sue's ringing, oh, I'll sort of right? talk through um, the slides in the meantime yeah, um, to cope with that. that. So, um, right. Do not have the presentation content. So, we talk about possible hypotension as a possible cause for this man dropping after going to the toilet. Uh, the Thank next one, post micturition syncope, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. Um, of course, he's an elderly man, he's quite at risk yes, of cardiac right. disease. He could be cardiac disease. syncope as well, and we'll talk about that. So what I want to do today is um, do a mash of um, conditions, syncope, talk about dizziness and vertigo and the possible causes for those three conditions. Of course they are different, vertigo is different from syncope, um, but I guess our patients quite often are vague in their descriptions and it's quite difficult to tease out which one of them it is. And I guess I'll preface this talk by saying that I'm not quite the expert in any of these areas. I'm not an ET surgeon, I'm not a vestibular neurologist, um, if there's vestibular physios in the room, they're probably better than me at, at those sort of conditions. But I do know a bit about how they pertain to um, teasing out falls in the elderly. So, syncope. Um, not all blackouts are syncope. Um, the definition of syncope is that you have a rapid loss of consciousness of short duration as a result of global cerebral hypoperfusion. So it's not a seizure. A seizure is something you need to tease out which is different from syncope followed by spontaneous complete recovery. So it's not hypoglycemia where you need to fill them full of sugar to get them conscious again. Um, and as I've said before, the elderly often have poor recall as to whether they lose consciousness. So that collateral history is essential to get in these people. And if there's been a fall in the hospital, it's essential to get the night staff or whoever's there, grab that history before they go off shift. So if you, if you're trying to tease out what's happening with syncope, what sort of history do you want to gather from the patient or the relative? What sort of things are you going to ask them? What they were doing at the time. Yeah, so yeah. what they were doing at the time. Anything else? Other symptoms. Um, are there related symptoms? Do they have any pain or yes. um, uh, nausea? Yes, absolutely. So other symptoms, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Anything else? Happened before. Yeah, absolutely. So, I um, mean, they're the group we're particularly worried about. It's a recurrent episodes of syncope, especially if it was injurious syncope, um, where they're fracturing each time or getting a head injury or whatever, with no explanation. I mean, they're the group that really need to work up. Um, so, um, you, and you might want to just ask, you might ask this group so, normally, when you get up in the bed in the morning, are you feeling dizzy? What about after me? Do you get up from the table? Do you feel dizzy? Um, previous episodes of syncope, as Mark said. And then the other thing is they're not sure whether they're blacking out, but if you get injuries suggestive of loss of consciousness, um, such as facial or head injuries, then I worry, because you and I, if we tripped, would probably put out our hand to protect ourselves. And the fact that these patients aren't doing that may suggest that they've lost consciousness at the time. Um, um, I'm sorry, you're not seeing these slides. This is courtesy of Sean Maher, this slide. Um, unlike Eeyore, who in this picture is saying, you never know when you're going to have a fall until you're actually having a fall, quite often that's not the case. And we talk about um, getting the history with syncope of the five Ps. So the five Ps are precipitance, what was happening beforehand that might have precipitated that syncope event. And so it might be hot, crowded environments it might be an emotional situation triggered the faint. Um, exercise, if you're getting syncope triggered by exercise, that's a concern because that suggests to me some sort of, oh, sorry, um, some sort of cardiac limitation, such as aortic um, stenosis. Um, were you doing some of those special activities, such as straining with micturition, that we've already talked about? Have you just been put on new medications? And that's what maybe is the cause of the syncope episode. Then the next P, so next P is prodrome, and with some of those symptoms have come out. Was it preceded by dizziness, nausea, sweating, chest pain, other things that might cue you into what's happening? So if it was chest pain, again, you'd be worried about cardiac syncope. Um, third P is palpitations, obviously suggesting a cardiac gauze. Position, so is the patient always upright when they Please fall? Note, the meeting is no longer being recorded. Oh, okay. It's all right. I'll just play around with that. Um, so position. If it's always in an erect position, I guess that suggests that maybe they're hypotensive at the time. Whereas falls that are, a syncope that occurs when patients are supine, 
um, is more of a concern, for example, of arrhythmia or, or um, heart condition. And then the final P is post-event phenomena. Um, so afterwards, are there features suggestive of a vasovagal? So are they pale, a bit clammy, um, but then make a fairly rapid recovery? Versus um, a seizure, which you're trying to tease out, even though it's not syncope, where you get prolonged um, confusion, prolonged drowsiness, take a while to get going, get up and you know, get back to the normal self. Uh, so syncopal events are common, they say that 40% of adults uh, report a syncopal event. Most of those, if you're sort of surveying our age group, are, are going to be benign sort of fainting episodes. As you age, the um, risk of you having a, um, a sinister underlying cause, and in particular cardiac cause, um, increases. So in the elderly, up to 30% have an underlying cardiac cause. So um, I guess when you talk about syncope, I think of it as either uh, non-cardiac versus cardiac syn syncope. <laughs> Sorry, was that a question? No. Um, and then the non-cardiac group, I divide into those that usually have underlying orthostatic hypertension, hypotension, um, so that's postural hypotension as the underlying cause, versus um, Events which are really, um, they call them neurogenic because it's usually vagal nerve and cranial nerves causing this um, situational syncope. And um, the situations um, where you can get this increase in vagal tone, which causes bradycardia and hypotension, um, include emotion, so that's what's happening in your simple faints. Um, cough, recurrent coughing increases the intrathoracic pressure, increases vagal tone drops your um, heart rate, drops your blood pressure. So, um, we've talked about straining with micturition, so that would largely be in men with prostatism. Um, and unfortunately, quite often you've got that strain and then you've got it, you, you become erect after going to the toilet as well. So there's a couple of phenomena happening there. Um, straining with constipation can also cause a similar sort of syncopal episode. Postprandial, so after meals, um, you get a lot of pooling of blood in your splanchnic vessels in your gut, um, and you're quite hypotensive after eating. And that's a typical residential care situation um, where patients have walked to the dining room, they sit down to have their meal, they get up to leave again, they drop. Or they do a slump at the table, which happens. Um, and then, oh, I keep on pressing the wrong button, sorry. Uh, carotid sinus syncope, I'll talk about. Slide on that. Um, you can interrupt with questions if you want to. Um, so, just talking about the first group, which is postural hypotension, I mean, that's um, the definition of that is a drop of 20 millimetres um, systolic blood pressure on standing uh, or a drop of 10 millimetres of diastolic blood pressure on standing. Um, and it can be up to three minutes after you stand up. So, that's essential when you're measuring lying and standing blood pressure. You sort of measure it immediately on standing, but you measure it out to three minutes. So you probably take, you know, at least three readings. Or also you might miss the drop. Um, and that also increases with age, because you really just get all these normal sort of feedback mechanisms. So you've got this thorough reflexive responsiveness, um, cardiac compliance, that usually your cardiac output would increase to compensate. Um, then you get this vestibular sort of sympathetic reflex arcs. They're all a bit blunted in the elderly. They're also blunted in people with um, poorly controlled hypertension. So you can get these situations where you get supine hypertension, postural hypotension, uh, which is tricky. Um, and paradoxically, sometimes you're trying to improve blood pressure control to improve postural mm -hmm. hypotension. Uh, so it's common again, so postural hypertension is said to be present 30% of people over 65, 70% of people living in nursing homes, not a big surprise to me, but yes. Um, and as I said, quite often you're getting supine hypertension, so overnight in bed they're quite hypertensive, which is a problem because that precipitates nocturia. So there's patients who are getting postural drop and now mm. getting up to go to the toilet you know, multiple times. Um, I've just put this little aside, which um, we always sort of think about patients with profound hypotension, postural hypotension of Addison's disease and whether they're actually low in cortisol. So, management, um, you're going to, uh, 
most likely it's medication induced and you're going to try and remove the offending medication. So what sort of medications do you think um, are likely to be involved in postural hypotension? Yeah, so your antihypertensives, um, uh, yeah, that's their direct effect. Yes, they can cause postural hypotension. Anything else? Sleeping tablets? Um, not plain sleeping tablets. If you have antipsychotics, the old fashioned ones such as haloperidol with um, sort of anticholinergic side effects, yes, they cause postural hypotension. Anything else? Not diuretics? Yes, absolutely. Diuretics do as well. So, right. So diuretics, we're talking about antihypertensives, antianginals that sort of overlap with antihypertensives, have a direct effect of dropping your blood pressure. And I guess some of these other medications are ones that are not used um, for their direct antihypertensive effect. So alpha blockers are a, a blood pressure medication, such as prazosin or tamsulosin, but are usually used um, for prostatism um, and have um, hypotension as a side effect. And that again is tricky because they're all the group that are straining with micturition and then you're making them a bit hypotensive by giving them tamsulose and now we usually use um, anti-Parkinsonian medications. So all the levodopa preparations, the dopamine agonists, all cause postural hypotension. Again, tricky because the Parkinson's group of patients are so high risk um, that again, you're giving them another false risk. Um, so whenever we're starting people on anti-Parkinsonian medications or changing the dose, we would um, we would be measuring the line standing blood pressures. Um, and the other group to mention are, are, the one, are medications with anticholinergic effects, and they can have anticholinergic effects just as a side effect of, of the medication. Um, and that happens with tricyclic antidepressants. Um, so, dothiapine, amitriptyline, the sort of old fashioned antidepressants still around. We've got a patient on one right now um, that cause postural hypotension. And oxybutyn, have you heard of Please that? Note. The meeting is being recorded. Um, <laughs> um, and oxycubitinum, which is used for bladder spasticity, so urge urinary incontinence, detrusor instability, has prominent anticholinergic side I mean, it is anticholinergic side effects. So again, if we, yes, quite often we actually do treat detrusor instability, but again, we're monitoring their lying standing blood pressures to make sure they tolerate this. Um, so I'll just move on to talk about um, the non-pharmacological strategies for managing uh, postural hypotension. Um, and I guess it was easily fixed by stopping the medication, you don't need to bother with some of this, but there are a group of patients that continue to have postural hypotension, there's no other medications to remove, or you can't remove it because it's an essential medication. Um, and then the, all of these strategies become more important. Um, have you got vision now, rural centres, or shall I talk you through these slides? We can see it now, thank you. Okay, good, excellent. Um, so, um, ones that we're all talking to our patients about, and they make sense. Uh, moving from supine to standing in stages, so they sit on the edge of the bed, take their time. All of this is very easy if your patients are cognitively intact, of course. Mm -hmm. um, it might be that they need environmental adaptations, so, you know, to keep a patient safe, if we know they've got profound hypotension going home, so you can tell me about this, but you know maybe they do need a grab rail or something to stabilise them whilst they're feeling hypertensive. Um, we know that sort of isotonic exercises, uh, leg butting exercises prior to and standing up can help. Um, so leg crossing, calf clenching, buttock clenching, that sort of thing. Um, full leg elastic stockings um, or abdominal binders or both. Um, really just save that drop in venous return when you're standing up. The evidence base for it is not particularly strong. A lot of these sort of, um, you know, current wisdoms have really tiny trials behind them. Um, and I think that's the situation with this. And certainly a lot of patients won't tolerate them either or can't get them on and off or whatever. But in a, a group of patients, you can get them to do it. I think sometimes the studies report that this is actually better tolerated and it has two-thirds of the effect of that. Um, but we don't seem to use it, and I'm not sure it's that available to us. Um, uh, these patients need a good water intake, at least 1.5 litres, hopefully 2 litres. Um, and this, there's quite good evidence for this, which is if you know that you have a situation where you're not going to tolerate hypotension, 
for example, before a physiotherapy session or whatever, rapid ingestion of two glasses of water, so 500 mils just of tap water, um, 20 minutes prior, increases your blood pressure by 20 or 30 mils, uh, millimetres of mercury, mm -hmm. and lasts for about two hours. So it's a useful strategy, again, in the patients that are cognitively intact, I guess. Um, they should, contrary to all our other patients, they should have a good salt intake, perhaps up to 10 grams a day. Uh, there are salt tablets we can use and sometimes do use. Um, uh, again, we do try to raise the head of the bed by 10 to 20 degrees in patients that we can't achieve a good result in any other way. Um, we've certainly got a patient like that at home right now that we're doing this with. Again, the studies are small, um, you know, they're not very robust, but there's a group of patients we are trying all these strategies. Um, and then, of course, patients with uh, high postural hypertension to begin with should avoid all those situations where they're straining and increasing the vagal tone. Um, so good bowel management, um, good, as good a management of their COPD, for example, as you can. And then to minimise the postprandial hypotension, and the strategies for that seem to be to suggest small meals, low in carbohydrates, which is tricky when a lot of our patients have a borderline intake anyway, uh, minimising alcohol, which um, exacerbates it. Sorry, Kate, can I just to check that they can yes, see it? Yes, they said they can see it. Oh, yeah. excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. You've sorted it out. Um, so in the group that really continue to have postural hypotension, um, You've probably heard of fluticortisone, it's probably the medication we use most in that situation, really because it's the only one that's available readily to us. Um, it's not a great medication, it causes fluid retention, that's how it works. Um, so in your patients with cardiac failure, they're not likely to tolerate it well, and it causes electrolyte disturbances, but we'll try it. Um, Mitodrine is probably the best evidence for it, but it's restricted access, so we have to do an individual application for each time we use it. So we do use it, but we, uh, you know, it's such a pain in the neck, we don't use it that often. Um, medications such as uh, pseudoephedrine and ephedrine are useful in trials, but um, lots of side effects and not used much. And this is what I mentioned about um, supine hypertension. So it might be ridiculously enough that in this group where they're having supine hypertension and hypertension overnight, um, so this requires monitoring. These patients probably need home blood pressure monitoring to work all of this out. Might need a short acting antihypertensive at bedtime so that you're controlling their blood pressure overnight and hopefully by that you reset all those baroreceptor responses um, and then all those strategies to improve their blood pressure during the day when they're upright. So it's quite, quite tricky. Um, most, most groups are much easier. You just stop their medications and they're good. Um, these are for the difficult ones. Uh, this is just a slide which is quite busy just to demonstrate how all those neurally mediated sort of vasovagal syncope um, precipitants work. So you've really got all these events, preceding events happening here, so emotion you know, acts on the cerebral cortex and then has a response, carotid sinus syncope, cough syncope, you know, acts on these cardiopulmonary um, receptors. Um, Airway stimulation, swallow think of it, I haven't heard of, but so, okay. it happens occasionally. Um, or mid-tuition think of it, acts on those GI, GU receptors, and they all then act on your vagus nerve is the 10th nerve. So it, these are all your cranial nerves. So really, you know, your 7th, 8th, um, ninth, 9th and 10th in particular, cause your heart rate to slow down, bradycardia. Sometimes these patients are getting asystole for a little while. Um, and cause vasodilation, which causes low blood pressure. Um, just to mention this condition, carotid sinus hypersensitivity, any of you heard of it? Uh, there's a huge body of evidence, largely coming out of England, there's only one or two centres that get very impressive research papers by treating this group of patients. Um, but the rest of the world sort of looks back and says, well, you know, we don't see this nearly as often. Um, so you don't need to know a lot about it. I still think it's pretty rare, but it can be a cause of unexplained cause and think of in the elderly, where you get hypersensitivity of your carotid bulb. So this same carotid area that, say with the patients with SBT, that you massage and it slows down your heart, they sort of get hypersensitivity of um, that carotid bulb, so it then slows down their heart too much and drops their blood pressure too much. 
And um, it's elderly men wearing tight collars to church, for example, just that tight collar can be enough. Then turning their head can be enough just to cause a bit of a carotid sinus massage and they drop. Um, so to tease this out, you really need to be doing cardiac and blood pressure monitoring whilst um, performing carotid massage. Um, and quite a bit of tabling as well. So it's quite a, um, yeah, we would do it through a cardiology department. Um, I, the bottom bit, which doesn't quite appear on the screen, is um, in the asystole or bradycardia group, if they demonstrate it with testing, they've been putting pace, pacemakers in them and uh, reducing the numbers of falls in these groups in England. But, you know, I don't think I've referred a patient for that. Just move on and talk about cardiac syn syncope. Um, as I said, the risk increases with age associated with an increased mortality. So it's important to tease out this group. And I guess the red flags for this are you know, family history of sudden death. There are some familial conditions. Um, if there's any sort of cardiac symptoms, such as chest pain, or they present with cardiac failure, history of cardiac disease, or if you get abnormalities on the ECG. So what are the causes of cardiac syncope, do you think? Yes. What type of arrhythmias? Um, uh, yes, so arrhythmias is definitely a cause, and they could be bready or tacky yeah. arrhythmias. Um, AF, you need to have a pretty compromised cardiac system for AF to cause you to black out. It might make you feel awful. Um, so more likely it's a run of BT or BF, so ventricular arrhythmias. Um, bradyarrhythmias, it can either be just a, a sinus bradycardia, perhaps induced by medications, or it could be a complete heart block. Of course, they can go down to asystole. Um, are there any other causes of cardiac syncope? Who will know? So then you get um, the group. Um, oh, I apologise for this. Honestly, oh no. There we go. My, my slides don't quite fit the screen. Um, the other group is um, cardiac structural problems. And the most common one of those is aortic stenosis because that's a condition that has its onset in the elderly, in the 80s quite often. Um, and they just can't pump out enough because of tight aortic stenosis, mm -hmm. enough fluid to maintain a cardiac output and to maintain a blood pressure. Um, less commonly, there's conditions such as constrictive pericarditis or um, in the younger group, there's um, Hogan, which is you know one of those conditions that the fo footballers you know, will suddenly drop with. Um, I'm just taking an opportunity to have a slide on my bugbear, which is essentially acting medications, and um, how I don't like them, and um, they're very much a cause of falls. Um, it's probably less known that they're a cause of syncope. Um, so we all know, this is medications, I know we've got Selby in here, and they could be giving this lecture for us all. Um, Risperidone, lantipine, for example, haloperidone, quetiapine, big group of medications. We know they've got an increased risk of fall, um, there's also, if you're using them in elderly demented patients, so not your schizophrenics or other groups, there's an increased mortality rate if we use them um, to the extent where uh, risperidone and the FDA black box warning, what are you against the use of them in demented patients in the United States? Um, and there's a couple of mechanisms for that um, increased mortality rate when they look into it. One is respiratory infections are more common. That stands to reason you're sort of sedating them a little bit. Mm -hmm. not, not protecting their swallow as much, but it can prolong their QT interval on the ECG in, in your cardiac rhythm. So your Q wave is here, and this is your T wave here. So instead of following this first wave, they have a delay and a long QT interval, um, and that can precipitate this um, tachyar ventricular tachyarrhythmia called tossard de point, or, um, which you may or may not have heard of, but anyway, it can be fatal and it can certainly cause syncope. Another reason not to use them or to minimise your use of them, I guess. Um, the good news is uh, the vast majority of patients don't need a sophisticated workup um, and the, there's been some trials showing that if you do a history examination, lying standard blood pressure and an ECG, it gives you a diagnosis in two thirds of cases um, and has pretty good diagnostic accuracy. And if, you, if your patient does not have any evidence of cardiac disease, no history of cardiac disease, then if you do that, you can roll it, rule out a cardiac cause of think of in 97% of cases. So you don't need to be doing a lot of um, halter monitors. In, I mean, a lot of them do have a history of cardiac disease, of course. But, um, so um, this is a case that came through Charlie's last year now. 85-year-old lady lives at home alone, actually presented with cardiac failure. 
Um, but when we took a more comprehensive history, she had um, some serious falls. So she had four falls, some resulting in fractures in the past, and she could tell us that at least on some occasions she'd had loss of consciousness. And this is her ECG, which um, on this tracing it doesn't actually, you can't actually tell how far she's going, but she's bradycardic. And the P waves here have no relationship to the QRS complexes. So there's probably one there, there's probably one there, there's one there, one there. Um, so she's got complete heart block and she got a pacemaker. So the ones that uh, we really do work up more, the ones with um, syncope with no warning symptoms, so they're just dropping suddenly, that's a concern. Syncope during the exercise we talked about. You have preceding palpitations, that's a bit of a pointer. Syncope in the supine position. Um, or frequent or injurious syncope. Obviously, as feature suggests with CG, you need to go down that EEG route. And um, I guess the investigations you do do would be echo if you're thinking that they might have a structural heart lesion. Um, halter monitors, we all put on these 24 hour halter monitors. Um, unless the patient's having syncopal episodes every day or palpitations every day, it's very unlikely to capture anything. And the yield is you know, only up to 20%. Um, implantable loop recorders have much higher yield, um, but are not used much because there was a man found cost involved, I guess. But certainly cardiology do do a few of them for us. Um, and only oh, the very occasional patient needs to be referred for chronic sinus massage, head out, tilt table testing. Oh, just to, uh, a reminder about you need to think about driving um, in patients who have had unexplained sympathy. There you go. Got a little bit more time? Or? Yeah. Okay. So you want questions for more podcast or? Yeah. Okay. So we'll stop. We'll go through and go pretty quickly. Um, and I do feel like I'm probably preaching to people who are pretty good at vertigo anyway, physios in the room at least. Uh, so vertigo is the uh, illusion, uh, patients experience the illusion of movement when they're not actually moving. Um, and the most common cause for this is benign BPPV or BPV, benign paracosmal positional vertigo. Um, and I've got a couple of sort of uh, illustrative slides on this, but, um, and I'll talk a bit more about the symptoms of it. And in fact, I'll talk about the core part of the movie. Um, just with vertigo, I've just put this warning down the bottom. Just be aware of the use of prolonged use of stematol in these patients, because stematol does cause a Parkinsonian-like um, condition as a side effect of prolonged use. Um, so really, with um, vertigo-related conditions, you should only have stematol for, you know, three days, it's that very acute situation, and then they should be stopping. Um, in benign positional vertigo, this is a condition that um, affects your inner ear, and these are these pictures of your semicircular canals in your inner ear. Um, and BPV is a condition where you get these development of these little particles, they're called otoliths, um, which are, well, sometimes free-moving particles brushing against the tiny little hairs which detect movement in your semicircular canal. So, and, and the most commonly affected one is the posterior canal. And every time then your head looks up and your neck extends, all of these start washing backwards and forwards, brushing against those little hairs and the patient's experiencing vertigo. Um, and this is how we detect it with a full pump maneuver. Is everyone familiar with that? Can I want to move straight on? Um, where we you know, precipitate um, movement of those particles in the posterior canal, this is for. There are some, sometimes the other canals are involved and it's more sophisticated testing. Um, and this is just a slide um, summarising some of the common causes of vertigo and how to tease out the symptoms of them. So BPV, you really should be getting that history that they really just have a few seconds of vertigo, which then settles when they stop moving the head, which they do then. So uh, typically they are reaching up to put clothes on the line, reaching up to high cover, that sort of neck extension is precipitating just five to 10 seconds of vertigo and then it settles down. Turning over in bed, I guess, quite often would happen too. Um, and um, it's important to diagnose because it's pretty easily treated quite often. So um, I'm sure some of the therapists here um, uh, can do an epilepsy maneuver which is, again, what's used for the most common type of BPV, which is really just that you do a whole pikes manoeuvre and then keep on moving them, aiming to tip all, the, tip all those particles out of the inner ear in the semicircular canal. Um, and it's 
um, often is effective. Sometimes it needs to be repeated. Patients love you. Um, so vestibular physios can do this. Um, our fourth clinic physios can do it. ENT surgeons will do it. You know, if you see vestibular neurologists, they'll do it. Lots of people can do this manoeuvre. Um, as opposed to, I guess, another common condition we would see is viral labyrinthitis. So they're the patients that are presenting with an acute, quite often overwhelming um, condition of, of constant vertigo, nausea and vomiting. So they're the patients that are really just lying in bed, feeling awful, vomiting, can't do anything because anything precipitates vertigo. Um, so that's usually a post-viral condition in a bit the same way that the Bell's palsy is, I guess. Um, and settles down over days to weeks. So really, um, you know, I think it's reasonable to give those patients stematil for the first few days before you then start doing sort of vestibular rehab as they recover and get going again. Um, and then as opposed to Meniere's, which is another condition, Meniere's disease, which causes vertigo. Um, and the history of the vertigo is quite different in that they will have um, episodes that come and go, but they last hours to days. And I might have a, a, a cluster of two or three episodes in one month and then I'll settle for a couple of months and then I'll come back and have another cluster. Um, and really what you've got to ask the patients for this is um, do they have any sort of auditory phenomena as well? So if they're becoming deaf, if they've got tinnitus, if quite often they'll experience a sense of oral fullness that they'll describe as well. So it's a, quite a different history. Um, so um, those conditions are you know, quite often managed down the ENT pathway. Uh, CERC is a medication that's used for that, betahistine, have you heard of that? Um, sometimes they get ENT procedures um, and they do respond to vestibular rehab as well. Um, this is all as opposed to uh, if you compromise your brainstem or cerebellar circulation, you can have a, what we call a central cause of vertigo. vertigo quite often accompanied by other brainstem phenomena. So double vision, facial droop, maybe, you know, um, long track signs. Um, so if that's a stroke, those patients would then go into a stroke pathway and stroke rehab, which would include vestibular rehabilitation. We've had a patient who actually had just um, really a vertebro basilar insufficiency problem with more of a chronic slow onset of terrible vertigo. Um, and it was a terrible condition. So, sometimes interventional radiology can um, stent those or dilate them up, but his actually couldn't be um, stented and he hasn't had a very good outcome, unfortunately. Um, the vestibular migraine, we probably don't pick up enough and diagnose enough. Probably people with vestibular migraine uh, should have a history going back into middle age at least. Um, and so again, when you're talking about pre, one of those five P's preceding symptoms is, well, mind you that was first thing to be, but um, with these patients is, um, have, do they have an aura, a preceding aura? So they're getting those little scotomas and scintillating bits of vision and things. Um, um, and acoustic neuroma is an important, uh, rarer condition to pick up. And that would be if they had a subacute um, over a weeks to months onset of deafness accompanying perhaps vertigo and perhaps facial droop and other surrounding cranial nerve problems. I think we'd better stop, and I suspect you guys know quite a bit about the stigma assessment anyway. Uh, yeah, I think we can probably, I could leave it on that. But perhaps, oh, perhaps I'll just, before I finish, um, just to mention dizziness. Um, it's such a vague symptom, and so hard to know what patients are actually talking about when they complain about it. And there was this study that, um, you know, with all the patient, elderly patients with dizziness, what, when they teased it out, what did they actually have? Oh, and you can't even see the percentages, but it's 40% ended up having a peripheral vestibular lesion, such as BPV or Meniere's disease. 10% had brainstem pathology, so lower. 15% were psychiatric in origin, so just anxiety related. 25% uh, had postural hypotension, presyncope, or leg weakness. So quite often patients are really describing to you that their legs are weak or their balance is poor, but they're saying they're dizzy because they're sort of wobbling all around the place. Um, right, I might stop there. I might just, I can take it back and you can read about some of those ways of teasing up peripheral versus, versus central vertigo. Um, any questions? Hi.
last question, I guess, about um, your lying and standing blood pressures. Yeah. Because yeah. I guess routinely, you know, if it's recommended that the nursing staff carry one out, you know how you're saying about the three minute wait to do it again. I just, I wonder if that often. I doesn't. suspect it probably doesn't happen. Um, mm. We, I mean, I talked to our, our nurses about that, but um, yeah, I, I think we under detect sometimes because we're not doing that. I think it can be even more prolonged. You know, you get those patients that start walking down the corridor with you guys, mm -hmm. and then are feeling quite dizzy further down the track. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's very delayed sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, any questions from teleconferencing people? Just one question. Um, the difference between vertigo and dizziness. Can you put that in a nutshell for us? Right. So uh, vertigo is when the patients are, are having the illusion that um, the world is moving around them. So they might, uh, typically it's when they feel like they're spin things are spinning around them. Um, but it can be that they just feel like they're at sea, like they've walked off a boat. And quite often, even if they're describing the spinning, I say, does it feel like you've just got off a boat? Um, as opposed to dizziness, which is very non-specific symptom. And as I said, quite often the patients are actually describing that their balance is poor, their legs are weak. Um, um, and on the other hand, I think, it, and there, I've seen studies about this too, that in the elderly, even if they don't complain about vertigo, if you do vertigo test, vestibular testing, a good proportion of them actually do have vestibular problems and they're not describing vertigo to you. So I, it, it's really tricky to tease out what's actually happening. Any other questions? 